about Calgro M3. I was listening to your engagement with Alec. I think you were on stage with Cy Jacobs at that time at the Biz News 4 conference. And you said that you shouldn't have exposure to property. In fact, if you have to, you own your... That's it. You're allowed one, yeah. You're allowed one. <laughs> You've just said Calgro M3, low-cost housing. In fact, you added to that statement that, and I think or it might have been Sai at that time saying that it was Western Cape property that was an appropriate asset if you were going to, to venture into property. So this low-cost housing is against a theme that you traditionally hold. Talk to me about it. So um, my view is has always been and remains that property is not a good investment, generally speaking, unless you sell property. And that's what Calgary does. It builds houses and sells it. It doesn't build and own it like REITs, own shopping centers. It builds houses and sells it. And that's how you can make money in property, by doing that. But owning property and getting a rental income and facing the maintenance costs and the taxes and the frictional costs of moving things around is no way to make There's a slight change in your narrative, and correct me if I'm wrong. I've always, I mean, I look at your, your bundle of twigs analogy, and I'm sure many of you attended the, the Business News uh, 5 conference, in mm -hmm. fact, which where you gave that presentation. And there it was about value investing was specifically looking at companies where there wasn't, you weren't sitting around a campfire singing mm. Kumbaya. Yeah, that's right, yeah. You were effectively uh, looking at either bad management or there was something that was driving that yeah. price lower. Now you're saying that you're looking for managers who are buying their own stock in terms of share buybacks, but not necessarily that the company is undervalued as a result of a, a negative manager or management or the environment working against it. Can you just unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I think that, that's a really good question. So in the past, um, you know, one relied on mean reversion to take up the value of a company when, when you're identified as being undervalued due to short-term headwinds caused by management to missteps, poor capital, or whatever the reason is for and, that, and then you'd put together a portfolio, a bundle of twigs, of a whole bunch of these undervalued situations, and then hope the market would re-rate them over time. So that's still the, the foundation on which the portfolio I manage are built. However, I've now added on this overlay, recognizing that the reason market, uh, stocks get cheap these days is not because there's something wrong with them, per se. It's because active managers are forced to sell them. And South Africa, it's even worse. So we're moving towards indexation here. So we are selling a lot of stuff to buy the index. But also, South African investors just you know, investing offshore. Nobody is interested at all in investing onshore. So there's even more for selling here than a place like America or the UK or wherever. Uh, we have this added complexity of moving the money offshore, selling local assets. And that's why you get companies on P's of two and three, the where there's nothing wrong with it. The management actually doing a good job. The business is fine, but it is irrationally priced because of the actions of active to passive compounded by onshore to offshore. So those opportunities are there. And so in the portfolio of the manager, I've tilted more towards good quality businesses, which are undervalued for technical reasons rather than business reasons. You spoke today, and correct me if I'm wrong, but around about $240 billion flowing into passive, passive index, Rough, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and roughly $250 billion going out. Yeah. Going out. A, a lot of that, uh, yeah, out of, the, out of the, the active managers. And you also spoke about the fees associated with, with active management. Given those numbers, and then the additional stat that you put in that last year, 74% of active managers underperformed the indexes. I mean, what's the future of active investment management is what I was asking myself. It looks pretty bleak. It looks about as bleak as Microsoft's future looked in 2015. You see, having, having interviewed Pete for, for many years in television, I was just observing his style when he was engaging with Alec as I was doing research for, for this uh, interview. And I realized, it reminded me that 
that Pete has these one word answers and I've got to make sure I've got 50 questions so that as soon as he says to me, yes, it's as bad as my, I come back with another question. I mean, don't you sometimes feel like giving up? I mean, how many active managers, and, and I won't go belabor this point, but I mean, the reality is, uh, we've also been having this conversation yeah. for many, many years and the stats aren't getting any better with the, not. the active I mean, investment. And that's why it, it's been 10 to 15 years now that active management generally and value managers specifically have faced a headwind. And that feels like a lifetime, but it's not. In the, in, in the broad sweep of history, that's actually a very short period. Um, and there have been similar periods in the past as well, for different reasons. Um, but, you know, it's always a it, it, good saying which says, if you want to catch fish, you've got to fish where no one else is fishing, fish with a fish hole. And that's how I see active managers at this point in time. The fish are there. The big fish like Argent are sitting there because nobody else is fishing there. Nobody cares. They take their money offshore and they're taking into indices. So that's where the fish are. And I think if you carry on fishing in that hole, you'll do fine. Is that true though? Is the pond big enough? Because, I mean, isn't the reality that the South African investment universe is, is so tiny? Obviously, this is beyond top 40, you're moving into the small and big cats, but surely all active managers are fishing in the same pond and it's not necessarily that big. Well, if, if you're managing like 500 billion rand, um, then you can't fish in that. It's like, uh, it's like ice fishing. The hole is only that big in this space for one or two sit there and fish. Everybody can't fish there, especially the big ones. Because they can buy the whole of Argent. I don't know what the market of Argent is. They can buy and it's not going to make a dent. So they, they're not going to waste their time because their time is highly paid. They're not going to waste their time fishing that pond. So it leaves it open for guys like, go and fish there. I've heard this from you. I've heard this from Sai. It's about the smaller investment managers, different investment styles, merging those. Yours is very different to that. Sai, we'll chat to Sai in a moment. So in this instance, you set up their size matters. It, and this is a, a phenomenon that we've spoken about repeatedly over the years, but the size of the big asset managers firmly counts against them. Over the, over the very long term, yeah. Over the very yeah. long term. But I, I do think there are benefits of diversification. So, you know, different people do different things. And if you build a portfolio to protect, important, to protect your wealth and to uh, hopefully grow it, putting together different styles of doing things, I think is a sensible way of doing that. So hopefully, people like myself and Sai offer something different. Just as a strategy, if I was running a big asset manager, but wouldn't I take some money, put it into an 800 million rand fund and rebrand it as a small mid-cap fund to play with you boys? Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, I think the move right now is away from that, actually, because that is, you know, uh, people in markets are herd animals and they want to move with their herd. That's where the herd is going, is going towards the index, is going to big stocks, going offshore. And when you're talking to your clients, you've got to talk that language, otherwise you're going to lose your client. So they might understand that that is a sensible thing to do, but they can't do it because they have to move. With the herd. They have to keep their clients happy and talk the talk. So I am mindful that this is an investment masterclass and that you've got your own allocated questions. So I am going to turn to you in just a moment. I've got two more questions for, for Pete. You've spoken and, and the, the first one I want to drill down into the Merchant Waste Value Fund. Uh, you still maintain that thesis and, and going back to, to last year, you stated that it's about investing in South Africa because the tide is against the stocks. You've got undervalued opportunities that you hold true, although you've added that additional overlay to say there are small businesses out there where you've got good managers and it's tide is working against them. There's nothing wrong with the business per se. The, the value fund, is there any significant change from thesis last year to now? You were very in favor of banks. I think we chatted just before we went up here. You out of, of ABSA, you're still in first strand. You out of discovery. You were in discovery uh, previously. Banks were very favorable for you. Do you still play that game? So, I mean, we've made some tweaks to the portfolio at the, at the edges. So we have reduced the banks a bit. 
um, for what it's worth. So we sold out of apps. So basically recognizing that the credit cycle, although it was quite muted, had actually peaked and was declining. So, you know, what we try and do when we when we look at sectors or stocks is we try and recognize where we are in the cycle. And we, we're very bad at forecasting where we're going with the cycle, but just trying to recognize where we are. Uh, and uh, about a year ago or so, uh, we recognized that the credit extension was firm at that point, albeit muted, uh, and that caused us to reduce our weighting. But so, but it's it's around the edges. It's not it's not massive moves. Uh, the portfolio is still very much structured the way it has been, and that's uh, tilt towards SA Inc, towards banks, uh, and away from mining at this stage. Still, we don't we have very little mining exposure. So it's still very much that, and and a lot of small cap, a lot of exposures to companies like Argent and Calgon and those sort of things. The worldwide, the flexible worldwide fund. I've had fewer conversations with yes. you about the global universe. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about your thesis. Is it similar? How do you approach the global space? So the worldwide flexible fund is uh, is managed on a very different uh, basis than the value. The value fund is a stock pickers fund where we try and identify stocks that are undervalued for different reasons. The Worldwide Flexible Fund is more of an asset allocation fund where we have a fixed allocation to four different asset classes, cash, bonds, equities, and commodities uh, on, in global terms. Because again, we say we can't forecast which asset class can do well when, but we know if we have significant exposures to each of these asset classes, whether we face a deflation or inflationary, a boom or a bust, parts of the portfolio will do well. And it is a portfolio that is aimed at, uh, at not uh, what I'm looking for. It, it doesn't. It's not aimed at uh, making you wealthy. It's aimed at protecting your wealth. So we aim for real returns in dollar in dollar terms. So it's managed with a dollar mindset, not a rand mindset. Although it's a rand denominated fund, it's managed with a dollar mindset. And currently, it's about seventy five percent. 80% offshore and 20% onshore, and the bulk of the onshore exposure is to SA bond. So it's more of an asset allocation fund than a stock picking fund. I use in the fund, I use indices rather than stocks per se to get exposure to equity. Um, you mean you're giving way to indexing? Well, except in the case of America where I use Berkshire Hathaway instead of an index. So for me, Berkshire Hathaway is a broad exposure to US. And away from a lot of the magnificence. Although it does have a lot of apple in it, but you know, can't have your cake in. So I just got some snippets of the Raging Bull Awards last night. I do know that Merchant West uh, picked up a, a Raging Bull for your Payers and Growers Global Fund, correct? Yeah, the Global Managed Fund, the Payers and Growers. It's income oriented managed fund. So I think, and, and that's important. Thanks for the question. I, I think the merger between ReCM Asset Management, Bridge, and counterpoint fund management, which came together about four years ago during the pandemic, four years ago, put these three businesses together, uh, called it Merchant West Investments. Um, I think the fact that something other than the value fund is starting to win Raging Bull Awards shows that the merger has been successful and the company is very well placed going forward. So I'm very optimistic about that. He wasn't paying me for that. Right. We're Great opening up. Question, to, uh, yeah, I know. We're opening up to, to the audience. I've got uh, questions there. We've got the mic. Go ahead. Peter, I want to say I've always been an admirer of you and your skills, and I think being a value manager is really tough. I say that because I know you lost your net bank fund five or six years ago. They gave up on Yet I think you had the courage to stick with it. If I remember correctly, you identified Harmony Gold as being one of those heavily undervalued funds. It used to report over 100% number one last year, so you were spot on, but it just took a lot longer to get there. Now, how do you cope as an individual faced with believing in your value philosophy and yet its, it's value is getting even cheaper? Yeah. Uh, with difficulty is the first comment. But I've, uh, I have been in the market long enough to know that these things come and go. And cycles come and go, and stocks come and go, and valuations come and go. So, and I have, um, you know, I approach it with a stoic type of philosophy. I'm going to put it that way. You know, I keep my expectations low, and um, 
for me, that's the secret to dealing with these inevitable cycles of ups and downs. I, I do think that if you, two things are very important when you are managing money for yourself or for other people is number one, patience, and number two, control of your emotions. If you can, if you can get those two things right, um, you can beat a lot of very smart people. So I try and focus on those things. And a third element, controlling ego. Yeah, well, I think that goes with your emotions. Yeah. Go ahead. Pet, um, every month, millions of Americans put money into 401ks. It just gets allocated to index funds and ETFs. What actually stops that juggernaut from, how do you turn it around? I mean, why, is it just not going to continue as is? No, I, I mean, these things, these things always seem as if they um, will never stop, but I think markets and capitalism, um, and markets as being a characteristic of capitalism, does have some self-regulating factors at play. One of the things that can stop it is a strong increase in interest rates, which will, which will attract more money into the fixed income space, away from the equity space. And that's why something that I'm looking out for in global markets is increased financial repression where you have interest rates going up but staying below inflation. Um, with, and, and then the second element, so, so that creates a high nominal growth which governments need to pay off their debt. So inflation above interest rates because um, debt to GDP is a nominal. But, but going along with that is exchange controls and prescribed assets. And you already saw that in the UK now where they came up with this new ISA that if you get a tax break, if you invest in this ISA, that only invests in UK stocks. Um, so if you have start having prescribed assets where governments say you have, they have so much in bonds because they're struggling, they might be struggling to sell their bonds to finance their debt levels. And this put into the US uh, and Japan. Uh, it could force a lot of money out of equity into bonds because you have to do so. You know, that's another factor. So, and I think for me, that's probably the most important thing to watch right now in global markets is how far governments will go with financial repression. Can I unpack that a little further as we move the mic? So everybody's talking about an interest rate cutting cycle towards the end of this year. Having chatted to to Alan Pullinger recently, they're saying there's got to be a very shallow cutting cycle. Is that what you're inferring here? Shallow cutting cycle, and then inflation remains high. Yeah, so I was trying to understand that we're going into what everyone does. Exactly. Interest rate. So my point of departure is that governments are sitting with very high debt levels globally, especially in Japan, especially in the US. I mean, those probably the, and Europe, uh, France as well, Germany to Germany, not France. So. Many developed countries, let me put it this way, many developed countries are sitting with very high debt levels. Now, to reduce those debt levels, you can do one of two things. You can tighten your belt and pay down the debt, but governments generally through history have not been able or willing to do that because that's a tough course of action. The easy course of action is to, is to generate high nominal growth rates. Growth is real growth plus inflation. So if you stimulate inflation, if you encourage inflation, by keeping rate, interest rates below where they should otherwise have been, uh, you can get high nominal growth rates, which effectively reduces the value of the debt. Uh, and I think that's the way governments will be going. Um, when they, yeah, so when they cut, I, I don't know what the pattern of interest rate and you said this over and over. You don't forecast. I, no idea. That comes to side. We're going to talk to him about forecasting. But but I do know that governments generally take the uh, course of least resistance. And in my mind, that is financial repression, higher inflation, higher devaluing their currency, effectively devaluing the currency to pay back the debt. That has been the behavior of governments worldwide throughout history, and I see no reason for them to change. I think in in the. The Business News uh, 5 conference, you referred to politicians as narcoleptic imbeciles. Was I that kind to them? <laughs> Actually, 
resonate having hosted many conferences across the African continent with most of the presidents fast asleep. Would wonder if gold plays a role in your portfolio. If so, or if not, why? Okay, so uh, two portfolios. The value fund, um, I don't own a lot of gold there. I don't think gold stocks per se are very cheap. Um, but in the Worldwide Flexible Fund, I own a lot of physical gold and gold streaming companies, which are sort of the first derivative of owning physical gold. So there I have about 20% of the fund in gold and Bitcoin. Going back to the worldwide, the, the flexible worldwide wide fund, geographies that you, you favor, yeah. I know you don't like China. That's still your yeah. stance. Look, I mean, uh, yeah, it's still the stance. Um, uh, communist countries are generally not particularly interested in the, in the welfare of shareholders and businesses. So I'm not invested in China. I do like emerging markets generally. So we are avoid emerging markets in the fund within a very tight band uh, because we don't like to take big bets on sectors or geographies. You know, we want a fund that is stable and that protects your wealth and that doesn't take a big bet on some, some outcome over which you have. But at the margin, avoid emerging markets, overweight emerging market bonds more specifically than equity uh, and quite underweight the US. Completely left field question, but I've always wondered how you keep your IP given the fact that you have to publish your, your fund fact sheets and you talk about this formula fishing where no others fish. Your performance then dictates, uh, what do they say, the, the biggest form of flattery is uh, emulation. Or, yeah. So surely people are, are, are looking at that. Yeah, but I think the IP is exactly the question the gentleman at the top asked. The IP is control of your emotions and patience. That's the IP. Um, and that's hard to copy. Very few people can copy that. You can copy the stocks all day long. Uh, that, uh, you know, but, you know, who knows when you buy and sell these things. Uh, but the IP is controlling your emotions and, and patience. Who do you see as your competitor? Um, in the value spaces of Africa, there are very few. I think Sai, uh, but Sai does something different. Um, I think uh, the way we do things probably complement each other rather than compete with each other. I think John Bickard, well, he's the only other value guy out there, really, um, other than myself. I, there are no very few value investors. There are very few value investors. What about PSG and, and their, their I, value thesis? I guess so. I guess so. And we'll have to see whether they stick to it over time. I don't know. I can't say. What about patience and, and controlling your emotions? Yeah. Pete, uh, I also want to talk to you about the political environment. I know many people in this room have attended many speeches today, presentations, not speeches, which is the biz news formula, where you have the Q&A opportunity. Has anything changed or altered your view on, on politics other than the narc narcoleptic imbeciles? No, I my, my view has always been to try and... Uh, Stay away from politics. Try and ignore it as far as possible. Although it's very hard to do that, um, because over time, um, I think, especially in places like this, people end up doing it for themselves. Where the politicians, whatever they do, doesn't really matter. So I, and, and also, I think if you take broad uh, trends, uh, political trends, it's probably best to stick with those. Like, you know, politicians will always take the course of least resistance. I mean that. If you if you if you take that point of view, I think that's a fairly safe thing to be. Um, but trying to forecast election outcomes or what happens after that, I mean, I think it's very it's very. Does it present a buying opportunity though? Uh, after the fact, uh, it might or it might not, depending on what happens. Should you buy before um, the fact? I don't know. I, I I buy when stuff is cheap. They're cheap right now, and uh, I. So so there are two possible outcomes when you buy now. If you buy cheap asset right now, there's two possible outcomes. One possible outcome is the election is a disaster and the EFF and the ANC join a former coalition and it's just everything goes to pot, which has probably already happened to a large extent, but in any case, um, everything goes to pot in that, in that case. If you buy a cheap asset, you're probably not going to lose very much money. But if there's a good outcome, which is not impossible, and you buy a cheap asset, then you can make a lot of money. And, and that's the sort of odds I like building into portfolio. 
when bad stuff happens, you don't make money, but you don't lose a lot. And when good stuff happens, you make money. A couple of themes that you spoke about previously, private schooling, is that still an option for I mean, you? But people doing it for themselves. Where, so. Where's your exposure on the, on the private schooling? So in private schooling, I don't own anything in the value fund at this point in time, directly. Uh, through a story, we own a school that teaches um, beauticians in Stonewash called Isa Carson. So we, we own a school that does that, and the school is thriving. It's doing really well. So, yeah, uh, we have indirect, in the value fund, we own a story, shares in a story that, that's a part of a story. Logistics were also a plan formally, and you were talking about the private sector. When the public sector starts disintegrating, which ours has been doing for a long period of time, everybody's talking about the crumbling infrastructure beyond the energy space. Yeah. Private sector logistics plays, are there players out there that are interesting? I, I think Green Rod's very interesting. Railways and privatization of railways. So, so there are a lot of companies actually in South Africa that are, one, it's another company that's sort of, getting involved in the electrification or using energy. So I, I think if you look at any company in South Africa right now, it is increasingly forced to doing things for themselves, and I think they will end up making money out of that. ESG was another big topic. In fact, I will also be uh, delving into this topic with Sai a little later. And you, I think uh, Sai's commentary uh, at Business News 4 was that ESG had basically bolted ahead of itself and people were investing in, in blue sky. Where do you stand on, on ESG investments now? I think? Well, I, I, I'd probably answer that in the form of generalization. I'm always scared when people use uh, acronyms. As soon as the acronym becomes popular, um, I think it becomes a dangerous investment, like BRICS. Um, Fangs uh, and now ESG, because corporates are smart. They are super smart. They can identify a fad and they can, because the CEO of a company become, it's not the best business person who becomes the CEO of a company, it's the best communicator. Person who can best deal with people and communicate with people. So CEOs are very smart. They're picking up on trends and building narratives around those trends and parlaying that into increased market value, although there's no substance to it. So I'm always very scared when the acronym becomes very popular because it's an opportunity for good communicators to take something uh, out of nothing and make something of it. And that's not the base for a good investment. I'm trying to make good investments, not play narratives. Yeah. Uh, Pete, um, just one question from my side. Um, is there enough activism and education around capital allocation and share buybacks and other incentives aligned for CEOs to do that? Activism is a hard thing. Eh? Um, the problem with activism generally is that you fight the company with your money and they fight you with your money as well. So it's very hard to be super active and force companies to do things. I think soft politics is probably a better game to play. Um, there are checks and balances, but I think it's uh, you know it's it's not a fair fight. So it's, it's something I try try and stay out of as far as possible. Um, if I don't like what a company is doing, then I'd rather just not own the shares rather than try and fight with it because it's well, so that's it's, very different to what you said previously. In fact, you and Sai have both said it's better to be in the ring and fight them from inside the ring than outside the ring. It depends on the circumstances, but generally, my experience has been that fighting with these people uh, is like fighting with a pig. You both get dirty and the pig likes it. Let's talk uh, just very quickly. Any other questions from the room? Argent, you said, is at 18 rand. You said it's gone. Around about 18, I think, yeah. And it's gone from six? Six to 18, yeah. Is there still value in Argent? It's in a P of three and a half, yes. Buy and now. It's buying back its own shares, still, still buying back. And and Calgary M3 at four and you very bullish yeah, given the PE. Well, bullish is a is a difficult word. Uh, I I think it is a low risk investment. If things go well, it can make a lot of money for you. And if things don't get well, you're not Can I push you on and besides Argent and Calgary M3, I know <laughs> you've spoken RCI previously. Spoken in Sun International. There, there's there's so many so so many cheap shares. I mean, you know, if you there's this share competition that the guys run on X, 
And at the beginning of the year, they said, okay, you got to pick five shares. And I started A, and I went Avenge, and I went Astoria, and I went, and, and I got five shares just in A. They were cheap enough to buy. So I just gave those five shares. So you can go down the JSE, and there are just so many cheap situations out there. You see the brand. Or you can buy the value fund. The branding on X is starting to work. When somebody says X, not formally Twitter, then you know finally X is actually starting to, to gain traction. Pete, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think a large round of applause.